Hi folks, hi folks, good evening. Yes, you have to have your will in all. In the sun, the wind and rain, friends carry back faith and repeat. We are unique, oh yes, my friends. Now we are on our own at last. The world is not pushed us wrong. We are going to be a great nation. Poor children are bright and strong. Hi, good evening, good evening. I'm not too sure whether you can hear me, but welcome to Contending for Dominica, the 17th day of January, 2021. I hope that everyone is doing well. I hope that you are in good spirits and uh, that you had a good day. I hope that you went to church this morning. And um, I hope that you pray for the weak and the poor and the afflicted and that you are in good spirits. I hope that you are doing excellent Yes, and I'm um, being told that I am being heard loud and clear, so I'm very happy. Always a pleasure to be here with you, your host, Joshua Francis, attorney at law, former member of parliament. I see that we have quite a number of friends here this evening, and I want to thank you. I'm aware that you could be somewhere else, even as I speak. The Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Honorable Roosevelt Skerritt, has his program, and Pali. So you did not have to be here with Joshua Francis on contending for Dominica. So I'm very grateful to have you here with me, and I want to thank you. I hope that your family is doing well, that you had a great day. The week has started well, and you are looking forward to have a great week. Of course, all of us want a wonderful week, a beautiful week. In whatever we do, wherever you are, I wish all the best for you. Whatever capacity you'll be working this week, I hope all the best for you. And of course, the number one thing that we are concerned about is our health. So let us hope we have great health this week, great health beyond this week. Let me just recognize a few persons here on our weekly broadcast contending for Dominica. This evening, we are going to deal with population. Some time ago, we heard the Honorable Prime Minister, the Commonwealth of Dominica, suggesting that we should have an increase in population. So we're going to discuss that from different perspectives. As usual, I want you to be part of it. I want you to engage in the discussion. Uh, if you notice that we have had a few upgrades as far as our life is concerned, now we have the capacity to invite you live. So if you're interested in making a comment, if you're interested in sharing your views, I can get you on the broadcast. Of course, uh, the topic tonight deals with population. Let me just recognize Alison Pelty in Boston. I hope all is well with you. Welcome, Alison. Thank you for joining us here on Contended for Dominica. I see that we also have my friend here, Karen, from Eggleston. Karen, I hope all is well. I hope your family is doing well. Daria, how are you doing? I hope all is well and uh, that you had a great day. <laughs> Daria said that she's not pally in sort with the Honorable Prime Minister. 
I did tune in for a short time. It appeared to me there was a discussion with our very own Mrs. Etienne, the head of PAHO, and the discussion surrounded COVID and the way forward in the region, in Dominica. So it's a useful conversation. I'm not too sure what is still going on, but if it is, um, you can be enlightened from the discussion. Of course, COVID is everybody's business. It's not just a matter of concern for the United States of America and for Europe and for the more metropolitan countries. We have to be concerned about it. Thus far, we have been very fortunate that our numbers have remained very small. We have not suffered any death, but we must not take it for granted. We must continue to be educated and to take all the necessary measures to prevent COVID harming all of us. We want to kill this and we want to be successful as a nation. We will hope and we're keeping our fingers crossed that Dominica will not have any, any, uh, COVID casualties. So once again, good evening and thank you for being here with us. I'm seeing here stream to pages to chat with your audience, can comment to groups and profiles due to Facebook restrictions. So folks, just let me know whether you can hear me. I see that we have a few persons here. Once again, I just want to thank you and um, welcome. So as I said, this evening we're going to be dealing with population population, you know, um, Dominica's population has been relatively thin. The last, the last census which was done in Dominica was sometime in 2012. We never really got the entire gist of the report because it was not published. And as such, we are not in a position to say for sure, based on statistics, what is the actual population of Dominica. But usually we say that the population of Dominica is somewhere in the region of 70 to 75,000 people compared to Barbados, which has about 300,000 people on a much smaller geographical space. Dominica having the kind of topography and the situation has caused us to have a relatively small uh, population. Well, of course, you can um, speak to me via WhatsApp. I'm being told that the angle, my angle of the camera is not the best. So I just want to make sure that um, that you can see me properly. Please let me know if it's, if it's better. Of course, it would have been nice had I tried my new technology before I come in here, but um, trial makes perfect. So as time goes by, we'll improve on that. So once again, I, as I said tonight, we want to discuss population. What's your view? Do you think that Dominica's population should be larger? Do you think that with the current population that we can really make it? Do you think that one of the reasons why we have not advanced economically like our neighbors is because of our small population? Is it because that our population is relatively income impoverished and as such, we are not able to advance as quickly as our, our neighbors? Okay, so we are going to discuss population and we're going to look at it from different uh, point of views. Um, some time ago, I think in 2010, I wrote an article and it was titled The Magnitude of Immigration on Dominica's Development. Um, back then I wrote articles for the Sun newspaper. I was a columnist and I dealt with several issues in Dominica and one of them would have been population. We have had quite a number of concerns about our population from different points of views. When we look at Dominica's population, we are not only going to look at the numbers, but we want to look at the makeup of the population because over the past few years, mainly over the past 20 years, we have seen a change in the demographics in Dominica, meaning that we have more foreign population here. We have more Haitian nationals, more Spanish nationals, and of course, we have the economic citizens. Most, if not all, are out of the country. They basically come, they buy the citizenships, and they move elsewhere. They, they don't become citizens to really stay in Dominica. But there's always a possibility that something can happen, and these economic citizens can come to Dominica to stay. The question is, what would be the ramifications? 
But let us deal with one issue of great significance, brain drain. Because as I said, uh, population is a very wide area and we can look at it from different point of views. And this evening we are going to challenge ourselves by looking at population from a broad perspective. We're going to look at it from a multi-sectoral and multilateral point of view. And in that regard, we're going to address the issue of brain drain. We're going to address the issue of the relationship or nexus between population and economic growth. We're going to look at population as far as demography is concerned, as far as the different, the different immigrants we have here, different emigrants, um, sorry. So we're going to look at the Haitian community as a more positive than negative to Dominica, the Spanish population, the economic citizenship population, what would be the ramifications for Dominica moving forward. So we're going to start by looking at the brain drain situation. Of course, some of you on the broadcast here are Dominicans, professional Dominican, trained Dominicans, skilled Dominicans based elsewhere. You are probably in the United States of America, you're probably in Canada, some of you are probably in Europe, um, if I'm not too sure, but we have quite a number of Dominicans in Europe. We have Dominicans all over the world. And when you look at the composition of Dominicans in the diaspora, you would note that quite a number of us are trained. We are professionals, we are skilled. The question is, why is it so many Dominicans were skilled? Either they were skilled before they left, or they became skilled after they left. And if they are skilled, or if you were skilled before you left Dominica, the question is why? Is it that you are striving to achieve more material things? Is it that you are dissatisfied with the income in Dominica? Is it that you are dissatisfied with the infrastructure in Dominica? You're not satisfied with the medical situation? You're not satisfied with the roads? You, you think that we don't have enough recreational facilities? You think that we don't have enough uh, positive working benefits for employees. Several things could have caused you to leave Dominica, to go to the United States, to go to Canada, to go somewhere where you think things are better. Of course, we have a number of Dominicans in Antigua, in Barbados, amongst other Caribbean countries. So what is the impact of so many Dominicans like you who have decided to leave Dominica to go to the United States, to go to Canada. Well, of course, the impact is that by you leaving Dominica, you have drained or you have contributed towards a lessening of skilled professionals in Dominica. And I did not explain the importance of skilled people in a country. The skilled people are the ones who are involved in research and innovation. They are the leaders. They are the pioneers in different areas of our country, whether it is sports, whether it is medicine, whether it is education, environmentalism, just to name a few. Unfortunately, a number of you all who are professionals in those respective fields have decided to go to, to the United States and other places. And of course, that must have an adverse impact on the island because in the absence of the skilled people we need, it means that our productivity will not be so high. It means that we may stay in the dark in certain areas. It means that we have to try to get foreign nationals. And when you uh, get foreign nationals to work in different fields, like we see in medicine, as far as surgery in at the hospital, that is the Dominical Friendship Hospital, it comes at a cost. And of, of course, there, there may also be language barriers. The ideal situation would be for a skilled people to stay in Dominica. But that's not the case because you want a higher salary. You want to pay off your mortgages. Some of you undertook mortgages before you left Dominica and you felt that the salary which you obtained could not sustain you properly. And as such, you went elsewhere hoping to get more. Some of you who have left Dominica looking for better opportunities have had success. And some of you may have regrets. But... Um, Let's refer to an article which I penned in 2010 when I was a columnist for the Sun newspaper. As I indicated before, um, that article is The Magnitude of Immigration and Dominica's Development, um, written by Joshua Francis. All right. Um, essentially, in that article, I say that Dominica has hemorrhaged 
a number of highly skilled, talented individuals like you. And what that means is the depletion of our human resource. You being a professional living in Dominica, you have contributed towards the depletion of our human resource base. With a depletion of human resource base, it means that we are weakening our economic base, we are weakening productivity, we are weakening uh, innovation, and that is adverse to the country. Of course, some of you are in favor of out-migration, and some of you are not in favor. Some of you who are not in favor may be right here in Dominica. You think that Dominica is the best place. You're not too interested in higher salaries. You're not too interested in learning new skills. Uh, you're not too interested in being elsewhere. Well, some people have passions. And for example, if you have somebody who loves chemistry and that person wants to study chemical engineering, clearly that person would be a misfit for Dominica. And as such, that person would naturally travel as we have had. Now you have different views. You have the internationalist views. Who are the internationalists? Those who favor unrestricted traveling. So some of you, you do not care uh, where you end up because you see the world as a small space. You don't see Dominica as necessarily being unique to other places in terms of the dollar. And therefore you are an internationalist. You believe we live in one global space and you just want to make your money. Dominica's salaries and wages are low. So you go to Malaysia, you go to Singapore, you go to South Africa, you go to Ethiopia, you go to Canada, wherever you get the opportunity, you will go. You're an internationalist. On the other hand, you have those who are nationalists, those who are not too interested in uh, traveling to go elsewhere. Um, nationalists uh, believe that they are concerned about the adverse impact of out migration on the island and they prefer to give their skills to the islands. So some of you are very patriotic, you're a nationalist, though you have opportunities to be elsewhere, but you love Dominica. You love to go in the villages on the weekends, you love to go on the beach at Meru, you love to go down to Portsmouth. For you, it's not a big deal to be a, at a fancy uh, restaurant. It's not a big deal for you to be at some fancy recreational center. You love your little Dominica and you want to give your skills to the people of Dominica. A number of you are trained in different areas. Some of you are nurses who can get opportunities elsewhere, but you want to stay here because you're nationalists. Some of us are internationalists. We are prepared to travel anywhere we get the opportunities. Now, the international movement of human capital can have an adverse impact on an island. Do you think that the movement of Dominicans have had an, an adverse impact on Dominica. I want to hear your views. Do you think that one of the reasons why Dominica has not advanced as quickly as St. Lucia or Canada is because we have not, we have not uh, understood that the movement of Dominicans have affected us. Um, let me see what Derry is saying here. Derry is saying, Dominica has been suffering from a brain drain for over 20 years. Our students, after we have educated them, would rather remain overseas. Foreigners of a lower educational level have populated our space. The opportunities are better overseas. Dominicans has cheapened. Dominicans has cheapened, making it attractive for Haitians and, uh, and Dom reps and Chinese. It is sad. So... Here yeah, it is, Daria, saying that uh, we have had a brain drain situation in Dominica in that we educate our students for foreign countries. Well, um, yes, Daria, I do support you. One of our biggest exports in Dominica is uh, exports of our brains, capital. Our brain capital uh, has been a, a major export for Dominica. We basically prepare our students for foreign markets. A number of our students go to the United States of America to study, whether it's at uh, Bramlin University, Midwestern University, Monroe College, just name them. The question is, amongst those who go to the United States, how many of them come back to Dominica? Very few. 
some Dominicans are so desperate to stay in the United States, and that's their choice, that they would buy a marriage to get a green card. I know a number of my students, having taught for a number of years, uh, who left Dominica to go and study, and uh, they were prepared to do anything and everything to get a green card. Some of them actually bought marriages to get their green cards. They do not want to come back to Dominica because they think that the island is backward. That's their thinking. And um, they stay out there to contribute towards the United States of America. Of course, while brain drain has an adverse impact on the home country, the host country of these immigrants are uh, uh, happy. Um, I think I had referred to a study which I had taken note of in 2010. Of course, things have changed. But one of the things I had noted in my writing it says here, most of the problems caused by the brain drain in poorer sending countries are great. Migrants from developing countries are generally more likely to stay in the host country than migrants from advanced countries. The harsh reality is that only a handful of countries have been successful in luring their ta talented em emigrants back home. The International Organization for Migration estimates that some 300,000 professionals from the African continent live and work in Europe and North America. I just look at that, over 300,000, and of course now it's probably even more, 300,000 professionals. We're looking at doctors, dentists, engineers, nurses, teachers, to name a few, would have left the shores of the poorer countries, the more developing countries, to go in more advanced countries, for greener pastures. Now, when we lose the talented people, the teachers, the engineers, of course that's going to have an adverse impact on our country. And Dominica is no exception. Dominica is no exception. And the question is, have we designed a plan? Do we have a plan? Have we really addressed that at a national policy level? Everybody is saying, well, we have a brain drain issue here, but have we had a government who sat with policymakers to come up with a long-term policy in curbing brain drain, because we know brain drain can have a serious adverse impact on the development of a country, and Dominica may very well be one of them. The question is, has any government in the Commonwealth of Dominica instituted or formulated a policy to encourage our professionals to stay in Dominica? So for example, we send quite a number of students to New Mexico to study, but does the government have a plan for them? It's one thing to send them to study. The next thing is, do you have an opportunity for them? Have you created the opportunity? Have you created the environment for these graduates to come back here in Dominica? And clearly the answer is no. The answer is no, because most time we simply give the scholarship and we don't even adhere to the policies of bonding. In the past, when someone obtained a national scholarship you were bonded to the state of Dominica, and as such, you had to come back to work for a certain number of years. You had to come back to give service back to your country. Now, that's gone. That's gone. We simply give the scholarships. We take the resources of the state. We educate these people, and we do not get anything back from them. And that, to me, is an issue. I believe that moving forward, the government of Dominica must have a proper policy in A, giving scholarships in B, ensuring that people adhere to a bond. And from my understanding, in many cases, these students, these beneficiaries of the scholarships do not even have to sign to a bond. And therefore you can afford them for not returning to Dominica to give back anything. Um, well, directly, because the argument is that some of these people eventually work and they send remittances to Dominica. But remittances is not enough to develop the country. So let me hear what Irving has to say here. Irving is saying, has our government understood the brain drain issue in the country? When educated followers are crippled, sidelined for inner party supporters, Joshua, I would prefer to be in Dominica, developing my country. But so many things in Dominica has to change, including the government view of incorporating intellectuals into their development schemes. Well, Irvin is one of them who wants to stay in Dominica. He has stayed in Dominica. He's a trained teacher, 
but he wants to stay here to develop his country. Um, and I do agree, Irvin, um, as I said earlier, this government has not done anything to tackle the brain, brain drain issue. You give a scholarship as a government, you make no provisions for the return of the students. And therefore, the students stay in the United States, they stay in Canada, they stay in Europe. They develop these places and they don't come back here. Then it's good evening to you. Um, yes, share the video, please share the video. Share the video. We want to uh, expand our reach. We want more people to be aware of contending for Dominica so our discussion can improve. Of course, we do want to influence the policy making decisions on the island. If you realize we tackle non traditional topics, we tackle topics which are not necessarily sexy, and that is one of them. Um, the population of the country is an issue, brain drain is a major problem here, and we take it for granted because think about it. A country spends half a million dollars on a person to go and study, and that person gets his or her degree. Sometimes the person gets a master's with assistance from the state of Dominica, and even as far as a PhD, and that person does not return here. Some of these people who stay out there, based on the assistance they obtain from Dominica, not only they were schooled at primary, elementary, secondary, and college level, but they were supported up to university level. And they make no meaningful contribution to Dominica. Some don't even send a barrel for their parents. But I think that most do. They send some remittances back. But the remittances are not enough to propel the type of growth and productivity that we need in Dominica to improve our standard of living. And I'm just thinking that a serious government must prepare or formulate a policy to tackle that brain drain issue, because if it continues, then that will curb or inhibit our development, unless if you are prepared to just give Dominica to foreigners. I mean, look at the reality. Post, post, post Hurricane Maria, we had to get a number of skilled technical people from Jamaica and St. Lucia. It, it was an exposure of one of the weaknesses we have here. Our school system, no longer provides for technical programs as in the past. Everybody wants to do sociology. You want the sexy things. You want your nails to grow long. You do not want to touch the soil. And therefore, our government has departed from technical programs, the manner in which we used to have it. And what happens? Then technical persons are in the field. And those who are wrong are looking for better opportunities. And as such, we now have to be important skilled workers. Even as we speak, MMCE, who do they employ to put all their fancy clinics and housing in Dominica? Quite a number of foreigners. Chinese are doing those things. So people figure out, hey, you know, why should I go into that stuff? This is a serious issue. Let me just see what Dave is saying. Hey, Dave Bertrand, how are you doing? Happy New Year. Hey, Maslin, I haven't seen you in quite a long time. Maslin says, good evening, Mr. Francis. I am listening stating openly that students marry specifically for a green card, which is illegal just for them not to return to Dominica may jeopardize those students legally. Um, well, Maslin, your point is taken. I was just um, saying that uh, that's the reality. I have family members who are in the United States of America who, who marry just to get a green card. Um, some of you may not like it, but it's a fact. Um, I, do, I am not always diplomatic and politically correct when I make certain comments. I was just um, innocently identifying the realities that some people want to stay in the United States. They do not want to come back here for one reason or the other. So I hope I didn't offend anybody when I made that statement. If it is necessary for me to revoke my statement because I offended you, I sincerely apologize. I have family members who got married just to get a green card. Um, so if you're offended by that observation, I am sorry. Um, Dave, you're saying it doesn't make sense or any sense if every household has a graduate and when they return to Dominica, there are no jobs. Um, yeah, well, Dave, uh, good evening. The reality is that we had this millennial goal objective in Dominica, whereby the government stated it would have one graduate per household. But what has happened? What has happened? Um, 
First of all, we have not had one graduate per household, although we have made significant progress in that department, but clearly job opportunities are limited and therefore Dominicans prefer to stay abroad. Um, people stay abroad for different reasons. Some people for money, some people feel um, they have more opportunities. Some people prefer the high life, the fancy streets, uh, the malls, um, the theaters, and there's nothing wrong in that. Each man to his own. And I don't think that none of us should impose ourselves on another. If you think that Dominica is too backward for you, then that's onto you. I am not saying that anybody is man mandated to return here. We're just observing the adverse impact of brain drain in Dominica, and we're saying that this government and previous governments did not necessarily tackle the issue. And I think the time is right to take the issue into consideration. Because if we don't over years, Dominicans will realize that the country is gone. If you keep allowing skilled foreigners to come here and take over your hospital, take over dentistry, take over engineering, take over um, construction, then the inevitable result would be that you're putting your, the, the country in the hands of foreigners. And we are seeing it already. All right, so brain drain is um, a very serious issue. And both the IMF and the World Bank studies have acknowledged remittances from immigrants as a valuable source of foreign income. But they understand that, and I'm talking about the IMF and the World Bank, they understand that while remittances have helped to alleviate the life and quality of lives, that brain drain itself contributes to poverty. Because when you don't go back to help your people and to serve as a role model from a social point of view, that contributes towards stagnancy in your country. All right? Um, so we are looking at uh, brain drain, and we want to move from that in a few minutes. But um, we are saying that it's time that we develop some kind of um, program to curb the brain drain, brain drain issue. So let's look at another part of uh, population in Dominica. And again, we are having a discussion in context to a statement which the Prime Minister made some time ago. And we're looking at the Prime Minister of Dominica. The Prime Minister of Dominica says that um, we need a greater population. That's when he cracked a joke and he said that um, lately it has been raining and um, it's a good, a good thing for people to make babies. Of course, that was a joke. You know, some of you took, took it very seriously, but the Prime Minister was just trying to um, humorize in his statement. Um, do you agree, the Prime Minister? Do we need a population increase? Well, maybe you agree, you disagree. Maybe you are indifferent. We have had an influx of Haitians on the island in 2019. It is estimated that as much as 12,000 Haitians came to Dominica, 12,000. Now, if that is true, the question is, where are these Haitians? Have they contributed towards a uh, population increase? Are they positive to the demography in Dominica? Are they positive economically and socially? Are they contributing towards what the prime minister has suggested that we need a population increase? Well, some of you may be in favor and some of you may be in disfavor. Um, I think that the Haitians have made a serious contribution to Dominica. Their population would have contributed towards the economic growth. Every time a Haitian goes to the shop, he's putting his dollar into the economy and that dollar multiplies in the economic process. Um, some of you may argue that the Haitians are spending or sending more money out to Dominica than spending in Dominica. Well, I disagree because the Haitians have to pay for rent, they have to eat, and therefore it would not be possible for them to send more than what they spend because they are really not high income earners. These people are just um, laborers on the farms, on construction sites, and they play a very valuable role. And their increase would be beneficial for Dominica, but some of us are very superstitious and suspicious that some of our Asian brothers are not uh, sitting well within our religious circle. That's, again, people have, um, people have different views. Um, 
I am just going back. Hey, Maslin, I see that you said you did not offend me at all, stated my concerns knowing the ramifications. Um, Maslin, my statement is just an academic one. I don't expect that statement to have any ramification on anybody. The feds are not listening. Nobody in the State Department is here listen, listening to contending for Dominica. And even if they are, they are not going to become more vigilant and become more um, aggressive in looking for Dominicans who are marrying. This is just an academic discussion. And of course, we have been frank here. It's a fact that those things happen. I do not intend to cause any negative ramification for anybody. Each to his own, if you want to go to the United States, England, Canada, wherever, and you do not want to come back to Dominica, you want to marry a national in one of those countries to seek your citizenship. There's nothing wrong in that. I was not making a judgment on people who do those things. I was just discussing the realities as far as people being repaired, repelled from staying here. Some people will do almost anything and everything to get us to Dominica. And each to his own. If you feel you want to do that, go on to you. All right? Um, Daniel Benjamin, how can Dominica develop when the population of the school which I attended was 300, now it is 30? Now, um, that is an interesting observation, Daniel. As we speak, I notice that the government of Dominica is now repairing the Maho Primary School. As a matter of fact, well, it has been demolished. The school has been demolished, and a new school is going to be constructed. And what I understand is the population of the Maho Primary School is currently 30, 30. Now, you spoke about schools having populations in the hundreds. Things have changed. And one of the reasons is because probably we have more schools, we have private schools, and of course, we have people making less children. Again, we're talking about population. And as people get more educated, uh, people get more irreligious, more secularized, then people tend to have less children. Less children means less people to go to schools. And therefore, some of these schools are, you know, in a position where you have to question whether it's viable to have them. So for example, instead of having a Mao primary school and a Massa primary school, probably the authorities need to start putting the schools together. Instead of having Massac and Maho, you just have one primary school to provide for Maho and Massac because you have two communities which are relatively close. In more remote communities where it would create a problem for persons to transport their, their children to a neighboring school, that is more understandable. But for now, it would make more sense to just have one school for, one primary school for children in catchment areas, Maho, Massac, Campbell, and those areas because it is becoming um, economically, economically unviable to have all these little primary schools with um, 20 students, with 12 students, with you know, 30 students. All those things must be taken into consideration in policy formulation. And that is the type of discussion that we need to have going forward because clearly our population is not going to go um, very far if we're depending on our own fertility rate. Dominicans are having less children. I'm sure some of you here probably just have one or two, and um, you're not interested in having any more. And those of you with five or six, probably if you had to reconsider, you would say, hey, I would just have one or two. It's just a reality now. People are having less children, particularly in middle, middle income countries like ours. And um, the ramification is that population drops. So we have Daniel here. Daniel is saying, well, yeah, Daniel, I took note of that point already. You're basically saying that um, the population of the schools are very small. So, Daniel, um, while you talk about the schools, yes, I was saying that these schools, um, you know, they probably need to fuse or merge with neighboring schools. Less babies, less babies. That's why the Prime Minister made the statement. Dominicans have more babies. Those of you who can have more babies, have more, have more babies, increase the population, try to make Dominica population larger because we need a, a bigger population. More people means more spending. More spending means more taxation. More taxation means more financial resources to spend for the people. Higher wages. 
higher salaries. Even as we speak, right now the government is taking into consideration the needs of public workers. And in that regard, one of the items on such agenda is an increase in salaries and wages. So if the population is larger, the government is likely to make more money from taxation, more taxation, more revenue, more revenue. Hopefully things will be better for us. So make the babies. Make the babies instead of having zero. Have at least one or two, all right? Uh, so that can help our population. Now, again, we're looking at population and we're here talking about um, fertility rates. We have also been hearing about infant mortality rates. Uh, infant mortality rate. Somebody just um, sent me a message. I mean, just what you're saying. You're saying that is why I know you all. What is that person here? Some person is sending me something there saying, um, let me just take notes. Again, I want you to be part of the discussion. I'm not here to pontificate. I'm here to interact with you. And we're looking at population. All right. And I just want to take note of your comments. Yes, sir. Wherever Stephen, you're making some remarks here. You inbox me. Uh, all right, Stephen, you are free to make your comments. You uh, sent me a message and I've responded, sir. And you're here, um, waging and really seeing your toxins. No problem. Hey, Chris, what's happening? Um, welcome. I hope everything is fine with you. <laughs> Hi, Hi Miss Rule. Hi, Miss Rule. Uh, Miss Rule is saying that yes, we should have more babies, a bigger welfare list too. Well, Miss, Mrs. Miss Rule, if we have more babies and a better economy, there'll be no need for a bigger welfare list. Uh, more money more jobs available, higher wages, then everybody will be happier. Because ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to uh, improve the standard of living. And for us to improve the standard of living, we have to take a lot of things into consideration because standard of living is measured against income um, per household or per capita income. How much money are you earning? Some of you are not materialistic, but we live in a material world. Everything has to be purchased, you know? And you need higher salaries, you need higher wages. And I can understand why some people do not want to stay in Dominica, because at the end of the day, if you take, for example, you take a mortgage of $400,000, and your salary, if you're working, your salary is like $2,000 a month. You're looking at $24,000 a year, $60,000 in five years. $60,000 in five years, five into 36. Multiply that and see where you are as far as your mortgage is concerned. And that's the reality. You have some public servants. When the bank takes their installments for their mortgages, they are basically left with gas money and a little bit for food. And they have to depend on a brother or sister who lives in Canada or the United States. And that is just a reality. And when I hear people, you know, jumping up and down, making it appear that we're doing so well in Dominica, those are the realities you have to take into consideration. Because if you're earning $5,000 a month, you have a mortgage which takes $2,400. Calculate where the rest of the money is going. You may have a car loan. Yes, your car loan. You may have a student who did not get a scholarship from the government of Dominica at a university somewhere out there and therefore you have to pay a student loan so at the end of the day you don't have much money so you figure out you know what i want to get out of dominica and that is why a lot of our students do not come back and they're not interested in coming back especially those who have loans because they sit down and they look at the type of salary they could get in dominica this is what they could get in canada or the united states and they just figure out it doesn't make sense to come back here why come back here take a mortgage for 30 years and earn something, at the end of it, your disposable income is $500. That's the reality in Dominica. That's a fact. And therefore, we have now to pay for uh, population decline. 
Um, Marcelin Edwards, when was Dominica's last census? I think it was in 2012, and that census was not published. It was not published, and therefore we don't have the realities in terms of our numbers. You know, because we have to look at the demographics. Who, who's making up Dominica's population now? How many Haitians do we have here? How many Spanish do we have here? How many economic citizens do we have from since 1996, since we introduced the economic citizenship program? Where are these people? Will any one of them return to Dominica? At some point, if anything happens in the world, will they come to settle in Dominica? What will be the ramifications of these people coming back to Dominica? What is the Chinese population in Dominica? All right, important questions. Um, Daniel Benjamin, the Britica school merged with the Daly's Primary School and the numbers are still low. Daniel, that is frightening and that's a very good observation. As the, parliament, as the past parliamentary representative of the Rose of South, I remember going to uh, Jodel, Jodel Primary School. I would go there for school events and sometimes I would shake my head you know, you have the school just in a little area, and then you have like like little, um, I don't know how to call them, but the classes are very small. In some classrooms, five students, four students. And I am like, I'm like, but is it viable to have or to be running a school with 30 students, an entire school from, uh, from grade one to grade six, 25 students, 30 students, I mean, we really have to look into this. All right, Chris, you're driving your whole family. You said driving my whole family is in town, including my dad, all my sisters and brothers. Wonderful stuff. Chris, blessings to you and your family. I hope that you are, you are fine. Your year has started great and that you're one of them who wants to come back to Dominica. I cannot fault those of you who do not want to come back. As I said, each to his own. Some of you like the mountains. Some of you do not like the mountains, all right? So it's not everybody who wants to come back here and, um, and um, you know, stay in Dominica. Because, I mean, I feel for some people. I really feel for some people. I mean, I, I have students. I taught at the, at the Granby Secondary School, now called the PHR Secondary School. And I taught quite a number of people, and my students generally are bright people. I mean, of course, some people did better than others because of their socioeconomic background, some people hereditary factors, some people because of innate uh, abilities, uh, different propensities. But generally, my students were, were ambitious and continue to be ambitious. And then when you look at where they ended up, some people were fortunate to get to St. Thomas and then get windows into the United States and Canada. And those were able to really elevate themselves through the opportunities that the United States has presented. But those who hung around in Dominica could not find a scholarship to go and study, became teachers and nurses. I hear their cries. I hear their cries. I remember looking at a a pay slip of a public servant. She's in her 30s, and I felt for her. I felt for her. And you're looking at somebody who's 38 years old and was still looking at the possibility of leaving Dominica to go somewhere because she felt that she was just wasting her time in Dominica. And when I say wasting her time, of course, you're not going to measure life just based on money, but we need money to take care of ourselves. And yes, we, we enjoy the fresh air and the fresh water, but we do not want to be dependents all our lives, depending on our brothers in Canada or depending on our government to give us a galvanize every time the wind blows it away. I mean, what kind of development is that? You know, some of you are out there and you earn your money. Trump didn't have to give you a car. Biden is not going to give you uh, a car. You work hard, you work many hours, but you get rewards, and with that reward, you can take care of yourself. Here in Dominica, too many of us are struggling, and therefore, people are getting wiser. In the past, you know, because of a lack of education or because of religion, people were having big families, and they would just feed their children with a little thing, a little dash in. Now, women, all of a sudden, are much smarter. They say, things are hard, 
no children or one child or two children. I can fault you. What is the consequence? Drop in population. Should we allow the Haitians to come in to fill in the gap? Well, probably they are the ones who are working on the farms. They are the ones who are going into the small shops and the mini marts and their money goes back into the coffers of the government and that money has become available to operate the smart clinics and operate the uh, Chinese Dominica friendly hospital. So it is a cycle and we have to start thinking, where are we going? Now on that note, I want to address the economic citizenship program. Over the past years, we have sold quite a number of our citizenships. The question is, what is the ramification? What is the consequence, if any, for the demographics of Dominica? As stated, most of these economic citizens do not even come to Dominica. They pay for their citizenship. They have an agent, whether it's an attorney or otherwise, acting on their behalf. The entire process occurs without these economic citizens or potential economic citizens having to physically find themselves in Dominica. They get their passports, they get their citizenships, they are naturalized, they have their certificate of, citizen, of citizenship. And it means that they have equal rights to you. Whatever rights that you have in Dominica, an economic citizen has it, he can vote. He can buy land. Now, what is the population of these economic citizens? I was saying over the past few years, in 2017, as an example, within six months, we had over 5,000 persons buying Dominica citizenship. Now, if that's the average figure for six months, imagine how many economic citizens we have in, in Dominica from since 19. 96, all right, since 1996. Now, where are these people? What for me, something happens in the world? Something happens in the world and people are looking for some kind of uh, fortress. They're looking for somewhere where they can rest their head. Let's say right now we have this COVID situation. God forbid something else happens and people have to flee from the bigger countries and they're just looking for the small islands. Now, if all these economic citizens were to come to Dominica, just try to imagine what's going to happen. The economic citizens have money. They will come here, they will buy your property. Are you not seeing what the Chinese are doing? Go to Roseau, look at buildings. Are you not seeing Chinese names popping up? They are moving from being tenants to owners. That's what's happening in the country. The country is being taken away from us, from under our feet, because our population dwindles, our professionals are out. People like Marceline Edwards are there making a life for herself, but continues to be a Dominican to the bone. Every day, she's out there advocating on an issue, trying to enlighten somebody, trying to open an eye, trying to open eyes. Most of us, seem not interested. What is the consequence? Our country is being taken. So somebody has suggested here, I think it's Neron Newton. He said he should join PPA. We can talk about that, Neron. Marceline Edwards. People have moved away from the mentality of the mouth split it must eat. We live in a modern and more competitive era with economic ability foremost in mind. If the work wage rate is $4.05, how do you send families to have children? On what are they going to raise these children on? And Marceline is right. You know, and I mentioned that earlier. I alluded to that fact. In a country where the minimum wage rate is just $4.05 easy, I think that is like $1.35 uh, US. Just think of it. You're working for $1.35 US dollars per hour. Now, that's on the books. And that is not for everybody, because in all fairness, the minimum wage varies to the position which you have. But on average, let's just say you're earning $10 EC, that's $4 US per hour. Where are you going with that? Dominica electricity cost is very high. Food is expensive. Why is it expensive? 
because the cost of transportation is high. The import duties are high. Therefore, by the time the retailer puts his markup, the prices are high. So you have high, high cost of living, whether it's for your electricity bill and for food. Well, generally, services are not that expensive. Your cuts in Dominica are relatively cheap, but that's not a big deal. All right? So wages are low. Things are hard. Why should you have five children? So my senior, right? Um, my grandmother had nine. I'm not too sure whether she was living now in her teens. She would think of having nine children. It is very hard. You make nine children, you are more likely to chase parliamentarians around. And you know what you have to do to get favors from these parliamentarians. God forbid if your children are female teenagers. You know what happens. Again, I am not necessarily embellishing the realities in Dominica. I think that's one of our problems here. Yeah, everybody wants to be diplomatic in speech. Everybody wants to play games. Nobody wants to confront each other with the facts. And therefore, our country continues to go into decadence. So as I was saying, we are discussing population. And I want us to look at the economic citizens. We have moved away from the brain drain situation. We want to talk about our economic citizens. Have you ever thought of it that possibly we may have over 20,000 economic citizens? Well, we do not have, we do not have the facts as to how many citizens, economic citizens Dominica has, but we have quite a number of them. They are all over the world, Iraqis, Chinese, Russians, they have Dominica's passports. They have rights like you. They can vote and they can buy land. Just try to imagine if 1% of these economic citizens, some of whom are billionaires relative to Dominica's standard, if less, let's just say 0.5% of these economic citizens were to settle in Dominica, they're going to buy us off. They will buy commercial properties. They will buy the suburban areas, and they will buy agricultural lands because they have vision more than us on average. That's why some of them are wealthy. They will see the value in our lands, in our waters, something that we have not taken advantage of as far as improving the quality of our lives, and they will buy us off, and then we can become second-class citizens. So reality can happen. Marceline Edwards, she says, isn't the region making space for them by putting the indigenous citizen in the projects, that is apartment buildings? We see land acquisition in the middle of villages in the name of development. Example, the village of Wesley. Well, Marceline Edwards, that's a good observation and you're looking at the repercussions of this, something like that, and you're looking at the future. Because what, what they're doing here basically is destroying a community the community has legacies, people have sentimental relationships with the community of Wesley. By doing that, they are basically dismantling the sentimental values people have, their history, their legacies, their navel strings. That's what the government is doing. And it didn't have to be like that. But again, we don't care. We don't care because the boys have their club and it's all about money for themselves. Wendy Williams says, education, courtesy training, ought to be provided to Dominican professionals to be kinder to returnees. I am not interested in ownership, but instead offering my knowledge. In 2008, I wanted to return as a board certified psychiatric RN. The system was not receptive. Now that I have retired and ready to return, I will attempt to offer my experience on a voluntary basis children and women being of particular interest to me. Is there a place for returnees wanting to contribute to Dominica's development? I have found some people to be resentful, jealous, and discouraging. I am asking with a sincere patriotic heart. I am coming home for sure. What I do will depend. No offense intended. Wendy Williams, God bless your heart. Congratulations on your training, your accomplishments, and your equity, whatever you develop, wherever you are. You're a professional. 
you want to come back to your country, you have made up your mind, and you're asking for us to be kinder. Yes, Wendy, you have not offended me for sure. Generally, we can be very abrasive in Dominica, and some of us have the propensity to be very resistant to change. We tend to do things the way we like it, the things that we know, and we are not receptive to people who are trained and have better ideas. Wendy, there is a place for you in Dominica. While you may meet unkind people, we do have kind people. We do have a number of people who are willing to work with you. The question is identifying these people. When you come back, Wendy, you can um, start from scratch. Wherever you are in whichever community, you can meet one or two persons with like minds, and you can start something. It's going to take a leader to make the change. Wendy, you are a leader. Come back and make your contribution. Everybody can make a contribution. And professionals do not include only engineers and nurses and doctors. You could be a, a professional in a technical area. You could be a professional in counseling. We need everybody, all hands on deck. This is our country, and we have to stand for it, not only for the current generation, but for future generations. Because if we do not add value to our place of birth, then we become ordinary. We become like every like everybody. We just become an object, you know. And we are more than that. Hey, Daria, um, Norma Fountain Filbert. Good evening to you. Thank you for enjoying our program. We are just here discussing uh, population in Dominica, and we are looking at the demographics. We have looked at brain drain. All of us are of the same mind that brain drain is adverse. It has impacted Dominica negatively. We are also agreed that this country, this government, has put nothing in place to deal with the brain drain issue. As a matter of fact, the brains of Dominica is the second largest export on the island. Our first export is to sell our birthright, to sell our citizenship. Nobody no longer cares about national identity. Nobody cares about sovereignty. Nobody cares about national pride. Passports on sale, let us sell it like hot bread. And in exchange, we'll give ordinary people a little smart clinic and we'll build a few apartments and give it to them. We do not have to sell our passport to do those things, but we have a lazy, incompetent, and uninspiring government that has formed support from ordinary people who, who tend to be myopic, who are not looking beyond their nose and making it appear that we have a prime minister who is visionary and has done so well for Dominica. One good day we'll look back and realize that we have had a political disaster in Dominica. We have had a government that has not fully understood what it means to develop a people. It's just giving a little hand out here and there, and the consequence is damage to the legacy of our people. I mean, when I think of my grandparents, and I think of what they stood for, this is what we have in Dominica right now. It's really a shame. But let me take some more uh, comments here into consideration. Montex Baron, good evening. Um, Josh, too many times we are all hands on deck and needed, yet we get strong resistance from all sides. Uh, let me just say Montex Baron is one of my students, very intelligent, very astute, and she is a social engineer. Somebody like that has a very important role to play in Dominica, just as Marceline, and we have to find a matrix where persons in the diaspora, persons who are skilled, persons who genuinely care about Dominica to make a contribution. And Montex, I hope you find a place to give back to your country. Of course, intellectually, you continue to stand for Dominica. You're all, always out there advocating for a better Dominica, and I certainly appreciate what you do. Marceline, you said Dominica should include in its legislation that people who weren't, weren't born in Dominica cannot acquire lands in Dominica, with the exception of being married to a native Dominican, like in the B BVI or Totola. Well, uh, Marceline uh, is going to take a government which is serious, is going to take a leader who understands what he's doing to make those kind of legislative changes. Because as it is right now, once somebody becomes a citizen of Dominica, that person has equal rights to you who was born in Dominica. Those of us who walked with our shoes to carry our dashing from our grandparents' gardens to our homes, we have a relationship with the country. We have some kind of spiritual connection with Dominica. 
And then here it is, somebody who never ate a mango from a lika tree, somebody who never climbed a tamaulisen tree anywhere in Dominica, somebody who has never walked from one village to the other, never bathed in one of her rivers, comes here and enjoys the same rights that we have. It's really unfortunate. And those are the type of things we have to reconsider. Because right now, nobody seems to care. We get excited about the dollar. Big Brother gives us a penny. And we dance. We go on the stage. And we make these people feel they have done so well for Dominica. What is the consequence? Time will tell. I'm of the view that until we, we put a cap over the sale of our citizenships, this is going to be damaging to Dominica's legacy. So let us look. Let me just look at some other comments here. Um, Wendy says, Daria Eugene, on that note, who can compete to the price of houses in Dominica? Coming to try again, but I'm not optimistic. US dollars, no less. Seems price for rich foreigners, not regular Dominican folks. Well, Wendy, um, there are some houses. You can get a house in certain areas of Dominica without having to give out your arm or your leg. All right, so what you could do probably is to identify a portion of land somewhere, wherever you want to be, and then build your own home so you don't have to buy one wholesale. I mean, when all is said and done, Dominica is one of the best places in the world, if not the best. There are certain things which are unquantifiable. There are certain things which are immeasurable, like the quality of the air, the quality of, of water, the peace, the scenery, and Dominica has a lot of that. You cannot put any monetary value by such intangibles. And that's what makes Dominica stand out, the things of God. But as far as the work of men on this island, we continue to be very shallow and superficial. We continue to be led by self-serving individuals, people who have not understood that the true development of a country goes behind concrete. If you really want to develop a country, you have to deepen the history you have to deepen the sense of consciousness amongst the people. There must be some kind of spiritual elevation because until and unless we understand where we came from, what Dominica constitutes, what Dominica means, what it means to be a Dominican, then we're not going to really value Dominica the way it's supposed to be valued. We are too ordinary as Dominicans in terms of our thinking with the relationship with our water, the relationship with our people, all right? Uh, say, say good evening to you. Uh, the conversation continues. So I want to hear your views on this uh, economic citizenship population. Um, I, I am not going to speculate to say that we probably have 30,000 economic citizens, we probably have 20,000 citizens, but we do not have the facts. And given the number of citizenships that we have been selling like hot bread over the past few years, to the point where a prime minister of Dominica and the sitting prime minister would say, if not the sale of our passports, then what? So we have sold quite a number of passports and we do have quite a number of economic citizens, but they are not here. They do not come and physically settle here. But by virtue of the fact they are citizens, they, they then can give citizenship to their children. So if you have a young economic citizen, let's say he's 30 years, he's a billionaire, 35, 40, and uh, two years from now, he has a child. He can naturalize that child. Just as your parents in England, you were not born here, but your parents migrated to England, and for your parents, you became a citizen of Dominica. That's the reality. And then what happens if those people were to come here to settle? not even 10%, 1%. You know, 1% of these billionaires, they come to Dominica and they will do like this Chinese lady in Roso who has four, four prime properties in Roso. Don't you see it with your own eyes? You go on Independence Street. Did you see the new Chinese building? You go on King Church of Fifth Street. Did you see a relatively new building? Do you know who is the owner? Then you go on Great George Street. Who is the owner? You go down to Citronia, you go to Mont Daniel, the Chinese are slowly buying out the place and nobody cares. Well, some of us have to say something. I want to hear what you have to say. What do you think? Do you think we should keep selling our passports? Do you think we should uh, have any um, limitations? 
Do you think that we should have a cap? Do you think that in five years time, we would have made enough money from selling our citizenships and we would have used those monies wisely and as such, there'll be no need for, there'll be no need for selling more passports. What do you think? What's on your mind? What's on your mind? I, I want to hear your views before I leave here this evening. I want you to tell me what do you think about this economic citizenship program? Are you in favor of it? Do you think we should keep selling our passports? And if, we, if you're in support, do you think it's something that should be indefinite? Do you think that there should be a cap on the number of passports that we sell every year? So instead of just selling passports, we could say, all right, we have a, a limit of 10,000 passports per year, or we have a limit of 5,000 passports. Do you think we should put a ceiling on the number of citizenships that we sell? What's your view? I want to hear. So, um, hey, Michael Gabriel, I think you, I was just about to uh, read Michael's comment, but it disappeared. But hey, Gerald Dorset, good evening to you. I hope all is well. Hey, Gerald, I'm not going to give the specific address, but I was just giving an example of one Chinese person who has purchased at least three properties in Roseau, and she has purchased prime properties in other parts of Dominica. I'm using it as an example because where you have one, one person who has purchased at least eight prime properties on the island, imagine if you have four like her, multiply four times eight, 32 properties, prime properties. And over time, if this continues, it means that these wealthy people will get the best out of Dominica and will become their employees. And some of them are not even nice. They're just here to exploit the Jews from the island, just as our colonizers did, and we'll get the crumbs. It's like they say, history repeats itself. Well, you may not be a physical slave, but you may very well become a psychological and economic slave in time to come. Because if you are not careful, you will become a servant to the new masters on the island. So take note. So let's see, Ronnie, Roy, Matthew, Josh, why do people buy Dominican citizenship? Well, the reason why they buy their citizenship is to have access to countries, visa-free entry to at least 150 countries. Dominica's passport still has value. You can go to at least 150 countries visa-free or with a visa. In some instances, like in terms of uh, being a Russian or being uh, an Arab from certain Middle East countries, uh, their passports do not give them such honor. And therefore, by getting Dominica's passport, um, they're able to access some of these Western countries which they fantasize of entering. And therefore, they buy our passport to get access to Canada, the United States uh, countries, to name a few. Furthermore, some people uh, want to change their identity. When you buy a Dominican passport, you can change your name by deep poll. You can get a new name. All right, and that is happening in Dominica is something that happens uh, quite often and nobody pays attention to it. So you have John Blow, an Arab, he buys a Dominican citizenship and then by deep pole, he becomes brown sugar. All right? So John Blow from Iran, he buys an economic citizenship and then he changes his name by deep pole, and it's like he's starting a new life. He has a new passport, a new name, and then he infiltrates into Canada and life goes on. Uh, Marcin Edwards, Dominica is unique with a beautiful, with a beauty beyond compare. How can we not see what the Chinese are flocking after? How can we be so callous and ignorant with our inheritance, the legacy of our ancestors? Don't we know that they fought for their blood, sweat, toil, and tears? Lord, what's wrong with us as a people? Well, Marcin Edwards, that's deep. That's very deep what you have just said. But unfortunately, most of us are not that deep. We do not think beyond our daily expenses. We just think of what we can get now, immediate gratification. We do not ponder, we do not cogitate, we do not reflect on the legacies of our grandparents, our parents, and we're not looking at the world to come for our children. We are thinking of our immediacy. 
But for those of us who look back and we look at the legacies of our ancestors, it gives us some level of consciousness. It grounds us spiritually and it makes us visionary when you think of the world to come for our children. Sadly, very few of us think so, at least in Dominica. Hence, the reason why we have the type of leadership we have on the island. And people like myself, and um, Daria and uh, Maslin and Montex are trying to ground Dominicans to think, to start to think better, okay? So Ronnie says here, yeah, thank you. So these people are not buying our citizenship to come to, Domini because, to Dominica because they never will. Well, Ronnie, right now, most of these people don't even step their feet into, into Dominica to get a passport. Of course, we have a number of agents under the CBI program and these agents appear and act for these buyers of our citizenships. Everything is done by mail, and therefore, these people don't need to come to Dominica. Some of them come to Dominica out of uh, curiosity. Some of them, when they do, I have known one or two of them who purchase properties here. But generally, their purpose is not to come to live here. But what I'm saying, we live in a world which is very uncertain, a world which is unpredictable, we do not know what will happen next year or in the next five years or the next 10 years where people may be forced to leave their countries. So God forbid something happens in Russia or the Middle East and these economic citizens, these Dominicans, these new Dominicans have to flee. Well, they are Dominicans. They can come here to settle. And if they were to come here in large numbers, just as some Chinese are doing buying of Dominica, then they will buy of the country. And um, that is happening already, and nobody seems to care because we get little apartments here and there, which we're happy about, and then we stop there. We don't think beyond that. So Jean Jean Joseph, good evening. How are you? You said not what you're thinking. And uh, Gerald again is asking for an address. Gerald, you know, again, I do not want to personalize the conversation. I just made mention of that particular Chinese as an example of the developments in Dominica in respect to our properties and our populations. All right, so we're going to wrap that up in a few minutes. Um, I'm not too sure whether you desire to make any further comments. Hi, good evening, Lisa. Uh, we're always happy to have you here. Um, I hope that all is well with you. Just to inform those of you who came onto the broadcast late, we are looking at population in Dominica. We have looked at it from different perspectives. We have looked at population in respect to uh, brain drain. We looked at the demographics of population and we discussed the, the Haitian community. Now I wanna go back to the Haitians in a few minutes, but um, let's just wrap up this economic citizens uh, population here. Um, some of you don't seem to have an opinion on whether we should put a cap to the number of citizenships we sell per year, whether we should do away with the economic citizenship program in time to come. Our prime minister has already informed us, if not CBI, then what? So if you're thinking like that, it would appear as long as the Dominican Labour Party sits at the political hem of our country, we will sell our citizenship like hot bread. All right, because that's what we depend on. That's our biggest source of revenue for government. And we have not been able to diversify our economy. We have not been able to pull up other sectors to assist the sale of our citizenships. And the revenues that we derive from our economic citizenship programs have been used in non-economic growth projects per se. So build the apartments, or the apartments are residential. We do have a few commercial properties. We have the, the projects such as those with range, camping, ski, we have projects such as uh, Jungle Bay, Secret Bay. Well, yeah, those are great, but those can be affected easily by external shocks, such as we're experiencing right now because they are tourist-based. We need people to come here to patronize. But we have not had any monies from the Economic Citizenship Program being channeled into manufacturing. I mean, the government has not been innovative enough to lure investors under the Economic Citizenship Program to build uh, juice factories. Our fruits continue to waste. We do not have anything where we can say, well, the Citizenship Program has helped agro-processing. 
So our manufacturing sector is the smallest in the Caribbean. It is almost non-existent. It is in, uh, it's, uh, as we say, it's in ICU. Our production level continues to limp and our economy continues to be the smallest and slowest in spite of all the passports we are selling. Daria says Dominica has been prostituted and our current leaders are the pimps. Sadly, it's people who will face the harsh consequences later. When are we going to stand up and say enough is enough? But Daria, that's a reality. We do not seem to care right now uh, we are being told that the economic citizenship program is the best thing that has happened to Dominica. We get a lot of money. Thus far, the monies have been used to build apartments. Everybody wants an apartment, unlike most countries where public housing is for the poor and the weak. In Dominica, we have politicized public housing. I am happy that poor people are getting assistance, but a lot of these people who are poor, they are poor, income poor, because of the deficiencies of our government. When you have people in their 30s having to get keys to a public apartment and they're unemployed, it should be a shame on the government. A 30-year-old, supposed to have worked for at least five years already, made a contribution to Social Security and be in a position to take a mortgage. In Dominica, quite a number of 30-year-olds cannot take mortgages because this economy continues to stink. This country continues to rot in certain areas. And this government takes our CBI funds and cripple us economically, make us into dependence. And yet people go around celebrating their performance like it's so wonderful. It is not wonderful. No 35-year-old woman should be proud of herself for getting a key to an apartment. She's unemployed and then she still has to call on her pal rep to help her to buy a cylinder. We should have a country where people get jobs, they earn monies, they can build their own homes. In every country where you're weak, it is fair enough to get assistance from the government. But this is not how it works here. So CBI monies, let us build some apartments, let us build smart clinics, let us use MMC monies to do whatever. And then when you look at the circumstances in which these monies are being used, not only on non-growth economic projects, but on account, on accounted monies are going into the hands of persons who are serving themselves and their friends. And that's the reality. And until we stand up, until we educate our people and get them to realize that this government has done poorly and continues to do poor, then we'll be saddled with that type of leadership and we continue to sell our country to foreigners. All right? So let me just uh, see what else you're saying here. Master Edwards, you're saying, what are we, Dominicans, benefiting from the prostitution of our sovereign assets? No income generating projects. As a matter of fact, the proceeds of the CBI I used to, and um, the latter part of her comments has been truncated uh, Maslin, you are correct. Most of the monies are not in income generating projects. They are in dead end projects. As I said, I congratulate every Dominican who has obtained an apartment from the government of Dominica. But I am of the view that some of these beneficiaries or recipients got apartments because they have been financially crippled due to the incompetence of the government, which has failed to create an enabling environment for economic growth, to create sustainable jobs, higher incomes, higher wages, and lower cost of living at a higher standard of living. Those are the type of things that we need. And um, Russell George, he says, say it as this, the Labour Party turned Dominicans, Dominicans as beggars. Well, at the onset of the program, I said that I wasn't necessarily going to embellish my statements ought to be always politically correct because I believe that's one of the problems that has stagnated us as a nation. All of us have become players. Nobody wants to offend anybody. Everybody wants to play their game. Everybody is now looking to see what they can get. So people are tricky. People now stand for double standard. People are hypocritical. 
people do not want to offend. And um, of course, you know, when those things happen, nobody wants to call you out for your wrongdoing. Nobody wants to call you out for your tricks. And therefore, all of us are now players. So I am not necessarily going to embellish anything. We are going to say it as it is. Um, yes, yeah, so Angela, Paul, good evening to you. I hope all is well. You said, good evening, Mr. Francis. Our passports got lots of people very rich and some are suffering. Angela, that is so true. That is so true. Just look at the head of MMCE. I took it on my own to do some research on Anthony Hayden, the CEO of MMCE. And I could not find much except that I learned that MMCE is an indigenous company. At first, I thought it was a subsidiary to an international company. No, that company was established there. Its creation, its cradle, its birth is here in Dominica. And the CEO in Dominica, in post-hurricane, post-tropical storm Erica, allegedly offered the Dominican people monies to help restore the people of Petit Savan. It's alleged that the company's monies were used to build its apartments, and in return, the government of Dominica made MMC into an agent to sell our passports, to withhold monies uh, from the proceeds of the citizenship program, diverted into private accounts under exclusive control of MMCE, and to have the company pay back itself. So in other words, we are crediting monies from MMC. And um, it is rather unfortunate that Dominica has to be borrowing monies from one man because MMC basically is under the jurisdiction of Anthony Hayden. And we do not have to go far. We know that Anthony Hayden, the, the head of MMC and the prime minister of Dominica are friends such that MMC, the head of MMC, has allegedly built a house in Mont Daniel, and that house is now housing the Prime Minister at a monthly rent of 34 or 32,000 EC dollars, another 32,000 for the maintenance of the yard and lifestyle of the Prime Minister, and 64,000 EC dollars to take care of him. So, Dominicans, I really don't know what's happening. I don't know when you start to think, but that's the reality. So, let's just see. What's happening there? Um, I'm just looking for your comments. Emma Frederick, the truth always offends. That is true. And um, once again, let me just remind you to share our video. Share, share, share. We want our broadcast to grow. Our job basically is to help enlighten as many Dominicans as possible, try to get people to understand what's happening in our country before it's too late. Already the Labour Party government has deepened their claws into the history of this nation. They have deepened their footing on the lands and it's becoming more and more difficult to uproot this government. And the only way we'll be successful in having a change of government is through the power of the people. And the power of the people must be rested on knowledge and knowledge must be disseminated. And so shall we do. This platform basically is to disseminate information, to enlighten, to educate, and to inspire fellow Dominicans to take note of what's happening, to go beyond myopism, to go beyond party callers, to go beyond political personalities, and to look at the depth of what's happening in our country. The reality is that this country has gone or taken a bad direction. And until we stand up and we straighten the crooked, then this country will continue to plummet into a place that we will not recognize because there are so many things which are happening wrongly. And someone made a very important point. While this country continues to be saddled with the lowest minimum wage in the Caribbean, some people have gotten very wealthy. Anthony Hayden, for sure, has come into this country and made himself into a billionaire. Roosevelt Kerry, the prime minister of Dominica, is allegedly a very wealthy person. His friends and his associates are allegedly very wealthy, all from proceeds under the table from the CBI program and other uh, programs in Dominica, it's alleged. Well, we'll continue to support those of you 
who think that it's not a problem will support it. And those of us who think it is a problem will talk about it. We understand where we are in Dominica. Some of us will be victimized. But history has shown that those who stand against the status quo will suffer. And some of us are prepared to suffer. Some of us have already suffered. And some of us will continue to suffer in the best interest of the future generation. Unfortunately, we have given up on some of our fellow brothers and sisters. They have been purchased. Their souls have been given to the hands of the politicians, and they do not see beyond their noses. But those of us who are not purchased and will not be purchased will talk, knowing that words have power. Every rope has an end, and this current government has an end. I have no doubt. So, Angela Paul, you are right. Whilst we get crumbs from the CBI program, some people have gotten filthy rich from the CBI program. And Master Edward says that the process of the CBI is used to punish Dominica. Well, in certain respects, that is true. We, I mean, just think of it. I do not want to digress here, but we must understand that topics are interrelated. And while we are talking about population and the CBI program as far as economic citizens, the question was, how many economic citizens do we have Will we ever have a cap in the number of citizenships that we sell? What are the ramifications of selling our passports in terms of the demographics of Dominica's population? But while we're on that, um, I just want to raise the point in connection to what Marceline Edwards has identified. She said the process of the CBI is, is used to punish Dominica. Well, yes, electorally it is. Some of us suspect that the Labour Party government obtains monies from some of the CBI agents. Well, of course, you rub my back, I rub, I rub your, your back back. You give, me a, you give me a license to sell citizenships. I make millions of dollars. I'll give you a few hundreds of thousands of dollars because I want your government to stay in office. I want you to continue to support me. I do not want to change a government. I don't want anybody to take away my license to sell Dominica's blood. So when I sell Dominica's blood, I'll give you something in return. And that something is money, and that money has been used, continues to be used to blind us, to buy our souls. We saw what happened during the campaign. People could easily get 15,000 here and there, 10,000 here and there. Some of you were able to come to Dominica through a, a pass, through a, a ticket purchased and sponsored by the Dominica Labour Party. You had pocket change. You still got um, help for your family as far as building materials are concerned. Where's that money coming from? Well, some of us suspect that those agents who uh, sell these passports, you know, butter the tongues of the politicians in this government. And that's the reality, people. And until you stand up to, you know, to chant against those things, it will happen. It's really a shame when I see Dominicans getting on, you know, and talking about Donald Trump and Biden, paying attention to what's happening in the United States of America and talking like they so care about consciousness and so care about uh, political correctness. And here on our island, our country is being taken away from us by foreigners. And instead we stand up against it, we are actually supporting the status quo. It is very sad. But um, we're going to wrap, wrap that up in a few minutes. Um, it's always a pleasure. Once again, this is Contending for Dominica every Sunday from 8. Sometimes we go on to 10, so now we go on to 9, 9.30, depends on how hot our topic is. We discuss issues of national concerns. This evening, we're looking at population from different point of views. We're here talking about um, economic citizenship. Um, let me just see what's happening here. Emma Frederick, when Dominicans stand and say enough is enough. Yeah, it will happen, you know, Emma. It's taking some time, but more and more people will be enlightened and um, the change will happen. Historically, just a few people who always stand and sacrifice and then people die but if you bring the change, all right? So let your voice count. Let your voice be heard. Words are powerful. Nels, Nels, when will this madness end? Well, Nels, it will end when more Dominicans are enlightened about the reality. You cannot tell me that you are selling our blood. The passport is ours. The passport doesn't belong to the Dominican Labor Party. It doesn't belong to the government. The passport really is a physical representation of our blood. That's our life blood. 
and we sell it. And by the way, it's the cheapest in the world. We sell it like hot bread. And when the money is received by the government, those which goes into the consolidated funds, the monies are not being used appropriately. It is not being used to develop you. It is not being developed, being used to develop your family beyond now a smart clinic and a few apartments around Dominica. That is not enough. That cannot be enough. We want higher wages, higher salaries, better standard of living, and that will only come through an increase of productivity, will only come through economic growth. We cannot reinvent economics. People, lifestyles, and standard of living is directly connected to wages and salaries. And if people are not working, they're not earning their own money, then they become dependents, whether on their extended family, whether on a friend, and in this case, in Dominica, on the government. Until we can change things around, we are going to be saddled with a stagnant economy. We're going to continue to be the last Kakarat in the Eastern Caribbean and by extension in the Caribbean as far as economic growth. We have very little exports in this island. We're not manufacturing anything. Productivity is low. Our public service continues to be the bigger uh, economic player in Dominica. Our private sector is very small. Foreign direct investment is very low, and people don't seem to care. People do not seem to care. So let's, let's, let's continue to educate the people so they can see what's happening and to stand for a better Dominica. All right, now, as I said, we have been here for the last um, hour and a half. We're almost two hours. So we're gonna wrap that up in a few minutes. If you have anything else to say, please share your views. We are basically discussing population, population dynamics in Dominica, and our population dynamics topic rests on a statement which the Prime Minister enunciated a few weeks ago when he called for Dominicans to make more babies. And in effect, he has suggested that we need to increase our population. Economically, a larger population would mean more spending. More spending would mean more economic activity. More economic activity would mean a greater circulation of monies in our economy, which would increase money supply. And increasing money supply would lead to an increase in aggregate demand due to more manufacturing, more uh, economic uh, stimulation on the island. Now, we're just saying those things, saying in effect that everything would stay equal then Dominica could benefit from an increase in population. But if the population increases and dependency increases, then the adverse effect will outdo or offset any benefits from an increase in population. But do we need an increase in population to live a higher standard of living? The answer from my point of view is no. Look at St. Kitts. St. Kitts, of course, is a smaller geographical space. The population statistically and uh, officially would be about 60,000 or 65,000 there about. Yet, St. Kitts is probably three times more advanced than Dominica. Um, of course, St. Lucia has a higher population. St. Vincent has a higher population, not by much. But all these countries have advanced and left us behind. And Dominica is here limping and struggling with a government that keeps saying that it's doing well. And every time around, keeps giving us different reasons why we are not going to the higher level. All right. Um, Zed, how are you doing? Um, good evening to you, Zed Lloyd, my intellectual brother. I hope all is well with you. Um, so we have touched on the economic citizens. We have touched on the Haitian community. We have touched on brain drain. Um, we touched a little bit on fertility rates. Of course, you may have heard in the news that we have had some increase in infant mortality rates in Dominica. Um, I don't know how true that is. I've not heard it from the mouth of an official. But if that is true, the question is, why is it that we have an increase in infant mortality rate? What is happening at the maternity ward at the Chinese Dominican Friendly Hospital causing our babies to be demised? I'm not too sure whether that is true, and therefore, I'm not necessarily going to say much on that. What I do say, and what I do desire to put on public record, is that we want our fertility rate to be higher than our infant mortality rate. That has always been the case. And um, I don't understand why all of a sudden we would have 
an increase in uh, infant mortality rates. What I do know is that in as much as we have improved the physical infrastructure of the hospital, the management and the organizational situation for the hospital has not seemed to improve. And even if you have better roads, better buildings, a few uh, better equipments, if we don't have the human resource to manage the hospital well, then what is going to happen? We are going to get optimal results and therefore our health service department may not necessarily get to the higher level as we desire. But of course, preventive medicine is key. Those of you on the broadcast, I urge you uh, to take care of yourself and your families, drink your water, eat well, eat your fruits, exercise and pray, and let us stay away from hospitals and clinics. Of course, we need our checkups. You know, take, take your checkup, the women, I hope you're taking your pap smears, the men who are about 40 years dead, I hope you're taking your prostate test at least once a year, all right? That's very important. So uh, if you have something else to comment on as far as population is concerned, feel free to share your views. Uh, Gerald Dossett, just is time the electorate of Dominica wake up and smell the urine in the sandbox. <laughs> Ele electoral reform is a must. Gerald, I know that you're one of the leading advocates for electoral reform. And that will come. We will have that discussion and we'll have it for a long time. It's something that we need in Dominica. As I have said, it is not just electoral reform we're asking for, but you must be concerned about the type of electoral reform that we may get. The Prime Minister of Dominica has agreed that we do need electoral reform. He has engaged a former judge of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court in the name of Sir Byron. And Sir Byron has started discussions with different societies here in Dominica, and he will provide his report to the Prime Minister and his cabinet, who will then go to their legal draftsmen and present something in Parliament. We are fearful that some of the concerns we have may very well be legitimized. So what we constitute or what we deem as bribery and treating may be legitimized or may be legalized when electoral reform passes, so in effect, some of the things that we are looking for to change may not change. If anything, they will be emboldened and crystallizing law and the level, the playing field will continue to be unleveled as far as the difference between the incumbent government and opposition force. One of the key, key items which we must be looking for is campaign finance reform because that is where a great disparity creates injustice for the people of Dominica. When you have an opposition party which can raise just about three million dollars for an election and you have an incumbent government that gives three million dollars for a little constituency then clearly that's a major disparity and that is what we must continue to fight for we must continue to fight for uh, accountability as far as campaign finance is concerned we have a government we have a, a party in government that gets millions of dollars we don't know for sure where that money is coming from Clearly, somebody is providing that money, and whoever is providing that money must be the master of the leader of the country because nobody is going to give millions of dollars and don't expect to have some kind of power. There must be some kind of exchange between the donors and the Labour Party government in Dominica. So those are the things that we really have to champion. We, we should not just call for electoral reform, but we must present to the government what type of electoral reform we want. And I definitely would like to see uh, campaign finance legislation, which does not exist in Dominica, speaking to source of income and the limits as far as spending is concerned. Because really, what has happened over the past three years is that Dominicans have been purchased. People have been purchased. You know, when you have young boys on the block getting 5,000 here and there, again, I'm happy they got that money, but Nobody in any country should be able to buy a voter by just giving him money. And we need to pass laws and we need to effect laws to curb or stop or abate that type of behavior to make our electoral system more credible in the eyes of the world. Master Edwards, electoral reform is a must, but who are we asking for it? It's equal to asking a terrorist to build a church when we know for a fact that he only has the capability to build bombs. 
Well, Master, I was you know the way you put your <laughs> your thinking is very interesting. Um, yes, that is so true, and I have made that point. No prime minister who has common sense is going to do anything to disrupt his legacy, and therefore don't expect the Dominican Labour Party to enact any electoral reform that's going to undermine the electability of the Dominican Labour Party and to give an advantage to the opposition. And that is why I'm one of them who keeps saying that ultimately we have to win the hearts and minds of Dominicans, including persons in the diaspora, to stand against the Dominican Labour Party and to get more favor with the opposition. Electoral reform alone is not going to make the cut. We have to win hearts and minds. Gerard Dorset, UWP plus DFP plus APP, Electoral Reform 2021. Okay, guys, I think that we have exhausted our conversation on uh, population diversity and population dynamics in Dominica. Of course, we just look at it from a broad um, perspective. Um, before I leave, we probably could just look at population in terms of what's happening in the respective villages in Dominica. Have you noticed depopulation taking place in a few of our rural places like Cassibrus? I mean, if you carry out a census, how many people live in Cassibrus now versus the number of people who lived there in 1980? It would be a very interesting count. You go in places like Peter Sifria, uh, San Silver, those different areas, look at the population. Has there been depopulation? Is it economically viable to have these villages? Can we propose shutting down certain villages like what happened in Piti Savan, where an entire community was resettled? Would it make more sense to have the few in some villages move in orders to make the lifestyle better for people? I'm just raising a few questions because clearly it would appear to me that because of the hardship, the economic hardship in Dominica, and I'm not talking about um, just being able to build a house. I'm talking about having monies to be able to travel, having monies to be able to take care of our health, having monies to be able to pay our loans in, in comfort. That is what I'm talking about. Too many Dominicans are struggling in their department. And therefore, more and more people have left this country. And those villages, in some cases, are languishing in uh, smaller populations. And I suspect that Cassibris may very well be one of them. It would be nice if we do not just carry a census report, but we have social scientists going into those areas to investigate who, have, who has left, why have they left, and what are the consequences on these communities. Because when you look at Dominica, we don't even have a rural development policy uh, plan for Dominica. We do have Department of Rural Development, but um, do you see the execution of anything for rural places in Dominica, no economic activities for catchment areas. What is happening for the catchment area of Cassibrus, of the Kalinago Territory, San Sauver, Marigot, and those places? No project is happening up there to absorb employment, just a few retail shops, you know, a little uh, fixing of the roads, any pre projects, the same old. So those are the type of things we have to look at. I think a visionary government has to provide economic opportunities in structural areas. So for example, in catchment areas such as in the South, the government could look at what could survive there and to assist the private sector in developing something that could give people jobs and give people sustainable means to take care of themselves. But that's not happening in Dominica. It's not happening at all. Um, so brothers and sisters, I am about to step out. I'm Marceline Edwards. Thank you, Joshua. Great program. Marceline, I want to thank you for contributing. You're a very outspoken and vibrant lady. We may not always agree on everything, and that's good because it causes debate. But I certainly admire your tenacity, your perseverance, your intelligence, your consistency. That is how change comes. If you stand for something and you cower when the oppressor calls you out, then it means you're not going to get the change. Change will come by consistency. And those of you who have been in the struggle and you continue to stand for Dominica, not for yourself first, but for Dominica, I commend you. And I ask you to continue to contend for Dominica. So once again, I thank you. This is your host, Joshua Francis. We meet here at 8 p.m. every Sunday. As long as God gives me life and I'm able, I will be here with you to discuss issues of national importance. 
And I want to thank Daria for being here. Um, Emma Frederick, thank you. Daria, do not disregard access to the media. This is also a crucial aspect of electoral reform. I do agree, Daria. I just identified one component, but this is multifaceted, and we have to look at it from a multilateral point of view. And we need multi multilateral thinking. We need deep thinking. We need sincere thinking, because until such time, uh, electoral reform may pass and the system may not change. Hence the reason why we have to keep agitating, especially from a grassroots level. We must go back to the respective constituencies and talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. We must have town hall meetings. We must not just use uh, Facebook and the radio, but we have to use in-person meetings and conversations to stimulate conversation to get people to understand where we are and where we can go to make Dominica a better place. So let me just acknowledge some of you who have been here with me. Um, Kristen Nick Walls, you say censors should take care of rearranging constituencies. And um, Kristen, you know, it's interesting that you raise that point because in the, at the elections, for example, we talk about constituencies. I mean, when you have a large constituency like Rosa South, I had to move, you know, navigate from Lubia to Silver Lake, you know, run up Eggleston, go up to Georgia, come down Newton. You know, geographically is very taxing based on population. Uh, there's a huge disparity between certain constituencies, and we have to look at the, the constituency boundaries to make it more equitable on parliamentary representatives. Because my work or the, the incumbent right now um, has more compared to small constituencies like Vicars or Rosa Central and so on and so forth. So that is something we definitely have to look at. All right, Jared, thank you for your participation. I welcome you to, to, to join us again next week, Maslin, next week. And everyone else who is on the broadcast here this evening, we uh, continue to improve our broadcast. Um, soon we'll be able to um, invite other people um, because we need to, to be not just about me. I mean, I'm here um, and I do all the talking well so far, but I want you to do the talking. So Marcelin, probably next time I'm out there, um, next Sunday, I could indicate to you early what we're going to talk about. And you will be um, invited to come and share your views, you know, because we have the ability now to have at least four guests on the broadcast. And I'm looking forward to invite um, technical people or professional people or uh, trained people in the respective areas to come and share their views. So for example, Today, with Delta population, we could have had a social scientist, we could have had a professor, a sociologist, or an economist to share his or her views on the issue of population in Dominica. All right, so we're looking towards a better program. The platform continues to improve. The platform will grow, and the platform will make a valid contribution to the discussion here in Dominica. Intellectualization with sincerity, with good intentions, will not stifle, and the seeds will only generate growth for the betterment of the country. So let us continue to contend for Dominica. Once again, I want to thank you. I want to urge you to have a great week, wherever you are, in whatever you do. Keep in mind there is a higher power, and make some time to give thanks and praises. Do not complain. Wherever you are and whatever you do, acknowledge the blessings and thank God for it. We're in the land of the living and there is hope. No matter how things may be, whatever you're going through, look at the positives. Once there's life, there's hope. Make a change where you can. Remember to create an impact on somebody else. True life, true love, and true peace comes from sharing. You may not have money to give a brother or a sister, Give him or her a hug or a smile or something positive. Keep in mind, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody else, stay quiet. And where it is possible, say something nice. Tell somebody that he or she looks good and you share where you can. You know, give where you can. If it's a piece of bread you can give your neighbor, do so, so that your life can be improved. So let's continue to stand for ourselves, our families, and our country, and above all, our God, we believe in the Almighty Father. We believe in righteousness. We believe in sincere development. 
and we advocate and contend for a better Dominica. We do have potentials to be better. Let's keep in mind that we may have different views and opinions, but we can work in harmony, we can join our hands, and we can come together to stand for a better Dominica, a better region, and a better world. So once again, I want to thank you for being on our platform, contending for Dominica. Until next time, I say adios, God bless you, God keep you, and God protect you. I love you. Have a good one.
Yeah. 